Uh, if you have your Bibles, can you turn with me to Luke chapter 13? And we're looking at verses 1 through 9 today. Luke 13, verses 1 through 9. And if you're just visiting us, we're going through a series on the parables of Jesus. And today we're going to talk about the parable of the barren fig tree. Um, but there's some lead up into it, and so that's why we'll begin with verse 1. And as uh, out of reverence for God's word, can we all stand together as we read the word of God? <clears throat> this is what the Holy Spirit has to say to us this afternoon. There were some present at that very time who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And he answered them, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those 18 on whom the Tower of Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. And he said to the vine dresser, Look, for three years now I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and I find none. Cut it down. Why should it use up the ground? And he answered him, Sir, let it alone this year also, until I dig around it and put on manure. Then if it should bear fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the parables that come from the very lips of our Lord Jesus Christ. And these parables were stories that were to open our eyes to the kingdom of heaven and to the things that are true and the things that are real and the things that are urgent. And so God, we pray that your Holy Spirit would be with us for he is ultimately the author of these words. It is through him that we get the understanding that, that we need and so Holy Spirit, be with us in this time. Teach us, convict us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. You know, if you read through the Gospels, people who met Jesus were never the same. They were never the same. He always left an impression on the people. And for some people, they left rejoicing. There's other people who left angry some people jealous, some people sad, some people confused, uh, other people comforted. But when people met Jesus, they were never the same. And how is it that Jesus always left an impression on people? Part of it is because he was full of grace and truth. There was nobody like him. And grace and truth in full force and perfectly knitted together has a powerful, even shocking effect on people. And we just don't encounter that enough. Grace and truth being brought together in full force and perfectly knitted to one another. This passage is a perfect example of what I'm talking about. People came to Jesus with some of the latest news. And I don't think anyone was prepared for what Jesus would say next, which was, repent or you will perish. Now that is a statement of grace and truth. Now we don't have the people's reactions uh, recorded here, but I'm sure there were some people who were shocked. I think there were some people who were offended. I think there were some people who were thankful. I think there were some people who were confused and wanted to ask some more questions. But what I do know for certain is that nobody left saying whatever. That's the one impression Jesus never left, whatever. 
And it's this message of repent or perish that sets the table for the parable of the barren fig tree. So we find uh, in this passage that people came up to Jesus bringing up a a recent tragic event. Uh, They basically came to Jesus and said, hey, Jesus, did you hear? Did you hear about those Galileans and what happened to them and what Pilate did to them? Now, we don't really know the details of what exactly happened, but it seems that Pilate had massacred some Galileans as they were offering sacrifices, and as a result, their own blood mixed with the sacrifices, and it was just a terrible thing that had occurred. And this kind of event or news, this is very much consistent with Pilate's reputation as a brutal governor who often offended the Jews. During his rule uh, in Judea, there was a lot of tension between him and the Jews. Now, we don't know exactly how the conversation uh, moved that, that led up to them sharing this news, but Jesus, who always knows people's hearts, he was able to discern the spirit that was behind it. And we see it in his response because he basically says, do you think that you're worse than them? And that's very telling of what was behind, uh, you know, these people bringing up the news. And here Jesus, he exposes them, and in some sense he exposes us too, because he knows that when we as people learn about tragic suffering of others, two thoughts usually come to mind that we don't like to admit. Uh, number one, one thought that comes to mind when we learn of tragic, the tragic suffering of others is, glad it's not me. You know, there's a sense of relief that it didn't happen to us. That, that, that's the kind of dynamic that happens when you uh, pass by a car accident, right? There's a car on the side of the road. What are you thinking? Oh, I'm glad that's not me. And so we feel that way sometimes. And the second thing is, that goes through our minds is, oh, maybe they did something to deserve it. Karma. They had to learn a lesson. It was punishment from the heavens. And in, in, in Jesus' day, especially something like people falling, suffering under something like a calamity like this, they thought, oh, for sure they did something wrong. And then I think about uh, John 9, the man born blind. What is it that people had asked Jesus? Uh, Jesus, why was he born blind? Did he sin or did his parents sin? They're trying to explain it. And I think that way of thinking, even though we're removed from you know, the ancient world here, that, that way of thinking is still deep in us. We think that way. And that's the way we even process things even in our own lives. If things go bad, you know, we have a setback, there's a disappointment here, you know, we go through some kind of suffering. Part of us thinks, what did I do to deserve this? That's just the way we think. You know, ultimately, when suffering happens to others, behind the shock and the grief is the feeling better about ourselves. And, you know, I'm not surprised by the people, because I think if Jesus was in town, we'd want to share the same sort of thing. Like, we'd want to present our best self to Jesus, and when you share something like tragic news, it makes you on the one end look sympathetic, but also feeling good about yourself. I'm not them. In classic Jesus fashion, he speaks the truth to the people, and he says, don't feel better about yourselves, don't feel relief, and don't feel self-righteous. And Jesus says, basically, you are as much of a sinner as those victims. Their suffering and their fate will be yours too. You too will perish unless you repent. And Jesus says, you're in the same boat. You have actually the same destiny. And what's the difference? The only difference is time. That it's just a matter of time. And to drive home his point, Jesus himself shares another recent tragic event, one that happened in Jerusalem. The Tower of Siloam fell, and it killed 18 people. 
And so, you know, Jesus here, he's very much aware of what was going on uh, around him, what was going on in the world. Uh, Jesus, you know, was, was not living in a cave. He was not detached from the world. And I think here we see something of his humanity. If he lived in L.A. today, he would, he would also know that the Lakers had just hired uh, a, a new coach, you know, this past week. Jesus knew what was going on around the world. And when he brings that up, that incident about the Tower of Siloam, he raises the same question again to his hearers. But now he's talking about the people that are in Jerusalem. This includes all those great, respected religious leaders, all those honored members of the Sanhedrin, all of them. And as he does that, he raises things up a notch, and he says, they too are sinners. They are offenders, and they too will perish unless they repent. Jesus is saying, all men everywhere need to repent. Now just, it's very striking. Look how Jesus wants us to process tragic events. It's so outside of the box. Uh, Jesus, he doesn't feel the need to go into a philosophical or theological explanation about how God's sovereignty and his goodness allows some tragic things to happen. He doesn't do that. And I think the modern man would demand Jesus give an answer to that, but he doesn't even go there. And again, Jesus says we shouldn't start feeling better about ourselves. Don't start congratulating yourself because you avoided that disaster or that you're somehow better than these others. Instead, how does he want us to process these things? He says we should be humbled. That it should have a sobering effect on us. We should be reminded that suffering and death comes for all sinners. And since we are sinners too, that the only thing separating us from others who have suffered and died is time. He says we deserve to perish, that we will perish unless we repent. And if we take a step back, what is the proper response to tragic suffering that we find all around us? It's we ourselves repenting before God. What an unexpected response from Jesus to to the news, right? And can we just notice two basic things that Jesus repeats? One, that men are sinners, and two, that sinners need to repent. Number one, that men are sinners. When you hear Jesus talk to people, it was just a given to him. It was like one plus one equals two. It was not a matter of debate. That was the truth. And not that man was created sinful, but since the fall of man with Adam, this is true about men, that they are sinners. And so he spoke this plainly and regularly and repeatedly, sometimes even casually. Some of us remember uh, when when Jesus said... um, you know, you, though you are evil, you know, give good gifts to your children, how much more will God the Father give the Holy Spirit to you? And again, just saying it in passing, you're evil. It was, it was just such a basic thing, a basic truth that Jesus would always speak about. And as sinners, that we all deserve to perish. And again, he, he's not trying to be controversial. He's not trying to just shock people out of their pants. He's just speaking the truth. Jesus is like, this is the truth. That men are sinners. And that men, that sinners need to repent. You know, repentance was such a basic word and concept in Jesus' ministry. It was so important. If you were one of the 12 hanging out with Jesus, listening to him, listening to him teach, you would have heard the word repent all the time, all the time. 
And when Jesus sent the apostles two by two out, what did it say in, in Mark chapter six? It says, they all proclaimed that people should repent. They caught that. That people should repent. And brothers and sisters, my question is that is, 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 is this, is, is repentance in our vocabulary? Like, like, do we talk about it? Like, how much do we adopt the words of Jesus versus the, the words of, of the world? Like, are we using words like triggered, microaggression, ADHD, self-care, attachment, codependence? Do we use, throw around those words more than the words of Jesus? Do we speak like Christians, as followers of Jesus Christ? Because if we follow Jesus, we talk about sin, and we for sure talk about repentance. Now, not only is repentance like in our vocabulary, and that we talk about it, we mention it, but more importantly is repentance in our life. Is it something that we practice? Is it in our culture, whether it's in our church or in our families, that these are things we bring up from time to time? Hey, are we repenting? Oh, you need to repent. Of course, saying that with love, but, you know, is that, is that part of how we live? We, we, we need to bring this back. Now, I think it's easy to imagine a stern Jesus, a severe, judgy kind of Jesus when we hear those words calling people to repent. But I think it's wrong. This is, what, this, this is why. Because in the bad news that men are sinners who need to repent is the incredible good news that there's actually a way to be saved. There's actually a way to be saved. If we repent and humble ourselves, we will not perish. That's unbelievable. That's incredible. That if we repent and humble ourselves, we will not perish. Despite all of our sin, this is the only thing that's asked of us. These are such gracious words that are coming out of Jesus. Repent. Now, I want us to think about John 3.16 for a second. What does Jesus say? Whoever believes in me will not perish, but have everlasting life. Okay, pastor, which one is it? Is it repent or is it, you know, whoever believes in Jesus? Repentance, belief in Jesus. Which one is it that I may be saved? Well, they're not in conflict, but they're in harmony with one another because faith is like a coin with two sides. And on one side is belief in Jesus, and on the other side is repentance. And they always exist together. Those who believe in Jesus repent. Those who repent believe in Jesus. Repentance essentially is, is saying that I have sinned. That I fall short of the glory of God that I can't save myself. And oh God, have mercy on me because I'm a sinner and I need a savior. And then repentance is looking to the one who's calling you to repentance and seeing there, there is your savior right there in Jesus Christ. And Jesus says, I bore your sin on my body and I perished in your place to save you. And it's holding on to him with tears in your eyes, with gratitude, and with humility. It's coming before Jesus, collapsing on him, and trusting him as your savior, because you cannot save yourself. But along with repentance being the only thing that we must do to be saved, Jesus is also say, saying that it is the necessary thing that you must do to be saved. Without it, there is no salvation. 
Repent, or you will all likewise perish. You know what this means? This means that a general belief in God is not enough. Or, or, or the thought, well, you know what? I, I try to be good. That's not enough either, because in those instances, you can still be proud and you can still be self-righteous. Even if you believe in God generally, even if you're you know, sincerely trying to be a good person, pride and self-righteousness could still, is, could still be there. You got to throw your pride on the altar and sacrifice it. You got to humble yourself before God. And I think about last week, the tax collector. I mean, that's just a beautiful, just real terse way of expressing, you know, repentance. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Repent or you will perish. Well, this conversation that Jesus has with the people, it took an unexpected turn And then it leads into this parable. And Jesus is basically taking the message of repent or you'll perish, and he takes it one step further as he speaks this parable. And we'll get into it. Jesus talks about a vineyard owner, and he has this figless fig tree, and it's been three years, and there's no fruit. And in light of the context, we can gather that what is that fruit? That fruit is repentance. And so as the vineyard owner is seeking fruit, so also God is seeking repentant sinners. And in Luke 3, if you go back to the beginning of Luke, John the Baptist, he spoke similar words as he was paving the way for Jesus. He called people to bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Some of us who are participating in LFC LFPC teams, we know that memory verse, right? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. And then what did John say? Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit, that is the fruit that flows out of repentance, is cut down and thrown into the fire. Jesus is speaking the same things that John was. John is speaking the same things that Jesus ended up speaking. God is seeking Repentance out of sinners. Now, I just want to add that when the Bible speaks of repentance, it's, it's more than just tears or emotions or remorse. Repentance bears fruit. When the crowds heard John the Baptist preach about repentance, they said, what should we do? John, what should we do? And uh, John didn't say uh, something like, hey, you know, make sure you feel really bad. Make sure you go off you know, to a corner, cry your eyes out, make sure there's some emotion there too, and then after that, hey, you can go home. You've done it. That's not what he said. When people ask, what, what should we do? I need to repent. John said this, share with the needy. Stop swindling people. Be content with your wages. Our repentance is always going to manifest in fruit and things that are visible. Well, the owner of the vineyard, he wants to cut down the fruitless tree, but what does the vine dresser say? Wait, just, just one more year. Just one more year. And here on one level, Jesus is referring to Israel. Because if you read the Old Testament, Israel is often referred to both as a vineyard and as a fig tree. And part of what's going on is that God had sent his servants, the prophets, all the way up until John the Baptist, sent his prophets to call people to repentance, but they did not respond. And here the vine dresser says, hey, wait, wait, just just one more year. And this speaks of God's patience. The God here, he is slow to anger. Don't, don't, misinterpret this passage. This, this passage does not convey God's severity. It conveys God's mercy. Despite Israel's long 
and ongoing rebellion, they still had time to repent. We think of what Paul says in Romans chapter 2. God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance. Sadly, Israel did not respond to God's kindness and patience. And we see that as you, if you keep moving in chapter 13 into verse 34. What does he say? He says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. Basically, you were not willing to repent. And later on in chapter 19, Jesus, as he's heading to Jerusalem, preparing to die, he sees the city, and in Luke 19, it says that Jesus wept over the city. And he wept over the city, and he said, they they don't understand the times. They don't understand the opportunity that is before them. And they keep refusing to repent. We see how much our Lord loves people. For even Israel, in all its stubbornness, we see our Lord weeping over their unrepentance. But they were unwilling. And, and Israel is really to be a warning for us. We're in the last days. And that God's judgment is coming. There is still time to repent, but the time is short. And so how does the parable like, add to Jesus' message? It's this. Repent or you will perish. And time is running out. And while there's still time and while mercy is still available and has not expired, won't you feel the urgency? And in wisdom and in humility, won't you humble yourself before God and won't you repent while there's still time? And obviously, this is a word to unbelievers. Maybe there's some here not yet Christian. Maybe you're seeking God. And God is calling you to repent and to believe today. Not tomorrow, but today. Like, save your soul today. Won't you feel the weight of your sin? Humble yourself. Repent and turn to Jesus. And Jesus is saying, don't put it off. Don't, don't wait for your life to, you know, be all put together nicely. Don't you feel the urgency? It's now. It is now. There's this part in the parable where it says that the uh, vine dresser's going to do some digging and put some manure and, 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 and make some ideal conditions so that fruit will come from the tree. And I think it speaks of God having put together the ideal and perfect conditions for us to repent. It's in this, that he sent his one and, son, his one and only son into the world, Jesus. And that in Jesus, you see God's grace and truth so clearly and so fully on display. And if Christ if Christ crucified won't lead us to repentance, God is like, I don't know what will. May God have mercy on us if Christ crucified does not lead us to repentance. But I don't think this is just for, you know, the unbeliever. Because in chapter 13, Jesus talks about the narrow door. Verse 24. Strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. 
When once the master of the house has risen and shut the door and you begin to stand outside and to knock at the door saying, Lord, open to us, then he will answer you, I do not know where you come from. Then you will begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence and you taught in our streets. But he will say, I tell you, I do not know where you come from. Depart from me, all you workers of evil. This is also, this word is also for those who are religious and find themselves in the church. Jesus warns us that, hey, just because you hang out with Christians, go to church, you know, sing some songs, even go to Bible study every now and then, that doesn't mean that you are saved. And it is true that there are people who are among the people of God who on the outside look like Christians but have never humbled themselves and repented of their sins before God. There's people who are in the church who deep down think that they're a pretty good person and they're much better than most people And they've never repented. And Jesus says, there are people like that. If there are people like that in Jesus' day, there are people like that even today. And in God's word, it says that we are to examine ourselves to see whether we are in the faith, to test ourselves like this is a good practice for our souls. So let us ask ourselves, have we ever fallen on our faces in repentance before God? Have we repented before God? And maybe some of you are are saying, okay, pastor, so I got to think way back, you know, like have I ever had a time when I've, you know, repented? Here's the thing. Repentant sinners always keep repenting. Repentance is never a one and done thing. I repent, I enter the kingdom of God, and I never repent again. Repentant sinners keep repenting. So you don't have to think way back, like to, you know, college or high school and say, did I ever repent ever once? No, the question is, are you repenting now, today, recently? Are you repenting? Do you practice repenting? Repentant people repent. And this is not a time for me to come in and like make you doubt your salvation. No, this is a time for us to have an opportunity to confirm our salvation. Yes, that's right. I look upon my Lord who died for me. I am a sinner and I still have sin. Yes, I still need to repent. That makes complete sense. Brothers and sisters, when we confirm our salvation by repenting even now and on a regular basis, as some of you know, uh, my car broke down two weeks ago. Um, Some people were wondering what happened there, you know? Um, Here's part two, I guess. But anyways, By God's grace, our, our car was raised from the dead, so to speak, through, through desperate prayer and a really good hybrid mechanic. Uh, he, he saved our Prius, and, um, and he told me, you know, hey, Andy, you know, it was, it was this pump, this inverter coolant pump. So any of a, if any of you guys have a Prius, you know, beware of the, the, the inverter coolant pump. And he says, it, basically, it has a shelf life doesn't last forever. At some point, it breaks down. And when it breaks down, your car's going to shut down. And uh, I was like, man, I didn't know that. You know, and obviously, we weren't prepared for that. At some point, it was going to shut the car down. But we didn't know. We weren't aware. And sure enough, that day came. And, you know, Anderson bore the brunt of that whole experience. He had to pull over to the side of the road. 
You know, I went to go help him. All these cars are just whizzing by. And you know what? I'm that guy who always drives by, you know, cars that are stalled out or, you know, in an accident where I go, oh, I'm so thankful I'm not them. And, you know, you just keep driving off. All of a sudden, I was that guy. And everyone else was passing by going, I'm thankful I'm not that guy. Um, Suddenly it was me. And, you know, because I didn't know and, you know, I wasn't prepared. And you know what? I I sometimes think that this is the way it's going to be for a lot of people. This is what I mean. A lot of us, we're driving, we're seeing car accidents and cars stalled out and we're driving, we're like, glad that's not me. Keep going. That's not going to happen to me. You keep going you don't realize that you got this pump that has a shelf life and the car is going to break down at some point. You think you're cruising, and at some point that day comes, and then it's you. Right? And then you got to pull over the side of the road, and then you got to deal with that. There's a lot of people in life, it's going to be like that. You know, they're going through their life, glad I'm not this person, glad I'm not that person. And all of a sudden, it's their time. And they come face to face before God, standing before the judgment seat of God, and they're not ready. And time and mercy has expired. It's too late. They didn't think it would happen to them. It's just a matter of time. And so while we're alive by God's grace, not yet at that point where we face our maker, as we face God. Let us repent. Let us take hold of Jesus' words. Those are not stern, severe words. Those are loving words. Those are words of salvation. Those are words to save us. When we take to heart our Lord and what he said, and let's not have met Jesus and say, whatever, wow, wow, Jesus, what you're saying, that's pretty crazy, but taking that to heart and following him, yes, I will repent, trust in you, and be secure in my salvation in Christ. Won't God give us all the gift of repentance and that we keep on repenting, that we would know that this this word and the promise from Jesus is true, that we will not perish. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, We thank you for Jesus who comes at us with grace and truth in in just such a strong and powerful way. And God, I pray that we have ears to hear and hearts to have received this word, that it would drive us to our knees to repent. Help us to see our, our sins for what they are. Remove from our mouths all the clever justifications, all the lame excuses for why we are the way we are. But God, help us just to own who we are in our sin, like hate it. Oh, that we would, that we would come before you in repentance. And, and that we would meet our sweet Savior who loves us, who forgives us, the one who saves us. Oh God, we pray that it is our life and practice to be repenting and to keep repenting. And that as we do that, that Jesus is more and more sweeter to us. And we pray this in Jesus' name.